Right, I think we'll, yeah. I think we'll start. Um, so welcome to this uh, workshop, how to have our XBF workshop. Um, I'll start off by saying thank you to the people who've organised it. That's, that's Mark, Josie, Marine, uh, who've done all the hard work here. Um, so many of you will know, but some of you won't, the, who the Harvard XBS team are. Um, the three most important people are the three on the top, Dave, Sharon, and Mark, they're the ones who do the actual work and actually understand it, yes. Uh, Rob and I are the, the co-directors of our XPS. Uh, Rob and I and Sharon Mark are present today. Um, Dave is currently moving our supporters in Carbon uh, in one building for next. Um, he felt he needs to be on the ground for that. Um, right, I need to move on. Um, we already have a really strong connection between our XDS and the Talisus Hub. So uh, Mark, Shanrian, Dave, myself, we all did our PhDs in areas of catalysis and have strong links with Catalysis Hub. Rob stands out slightly, he's uh, more a materials chemistry uh, girl. Um, and that's reflected also by the samples. This is the this current stats. If you look on the Harvard XDS website, you'll find these are the current stats for um, uses of the Harvard XDS. And you can see that, that by number of samples, um, its analysis is by far the greatest proportion. By number of hours, it's a bit less, but still is the most. Um, aim of the workshop. Okay, so what we want to do, we want to tell you a bit about the solution here. We want to, I'm going to, I'm going to start, <laughs> I'm going to start off with a bit of a revision of that material, I haven't done the moment. And we've got some uh, speakers are for people who are not part of how XPS, but have used our services or use XPS in analysis of um, uh, catalysis. And we've got some corporate details about analysis of XPS data, a huge part of our, our um, Raise on Vetra in our SBS to help the community improve the standard analysis uh, that you see in the literature. We have a bit of a um, uh, tale of woe of sample um, uh, papers that have been published with awful analysis of uh, FBS data. We have a bit of competition to find the worst possible paper, and, and we are really coming to that. Okay, um, right, this is the um, program. Um, so I've done the welcome. I'm, what I'm going to do now is do a little bit about fundamental theory. Now, I suspect that most of you will know this fundamental theory better than I do. So I apologize to you, but some of our, um, some of our visitors may not. And it's important to have the basics before you move on and specifically. So I'm going, to, I'm going to do a bit of a lecture about. Uh, some of the basics. Those of you who know it, just treat it as an opportunity to pack me out and tell me where I've got it wrong, which I'm very happy to, um, to pass on the mark to um, correct the people. Right, so the way I'm going to do this is uh, mostly I'm going to use my undergraduate metering uh, technique and write on four. So I hope this works. Switching between things is a bit. All right, so I'm not going to mess around with the um, overall with anything other than the most important points for that. So let's have a look at some energy levels for some patterns. Um, so okay, okay so uh, these are energy levels. So this is um, so this is energy going that way. This is our uh, 1s, 2s, 2p. We'll fill some of these orbitals with some electrons. Oops. Views. And here we've got these are so these are core electrons, these are valence electrons, um, and this is our battery level. And um, as you know, the Fertilized piece of spectroscopy, we have radiation coming in, energy radiation is H nu, that injects an electron from one of these levels, um, and the electron then travels out into 
back in to be captured by our detectors, that electron has an energy, um, a kinetic energy, which is what we measure. This gap here is an important gap. This is the work function, and we don't know what that work function is. It depends upon the instrument. Depends upon the instrument, depends on the sound. Um, if you've got electrons being injected from the core levels, you need very energetic photons and you use X-rays. If you're injecting electrons from valence, you need less energetic and you use ultraviolet light. So valence electrons, that is yes. Core electrons, that is yes. Yeah, so most of what I'm going to talk about, in all of what I'm going to talk about, is going to be the next course. Okay, Einstein's equation said that we can measure what's called binding energy. So we calculate the binding energy. It's going to be the photon energy minus the um, uh, kinetic energy, which of course we measure. We know the photon energy, we measure the kinetic energy minus the work function. That's the contribution that we're taking. So binding energy is um, what we need to identify patterns of surface elements. Um, so what that means is that as your kinetic energy increases, your binding energy, oops, sorry, your binding energy goes to the other way. And the link between those two is not obvious because of the work function. So that link depends upon work function. And in order to fix those, um, those scales absolutely, we need to calibrate. So any XPS spectrum in any publication should have details of how you calibrate that data. Very important that you calibrate accurately. Um, the other thing to note, it's worth noting, is that your binding energy is traditionally um, displayed in XPS spectra from uh, right to left. So you increase from right to left, as opposed to um, most uh, graphs where you'd expect to increase from left to right. So that's a, a traditional way to do it. I'll we'll just switch. Here's a typical survey scan. This is of a gold surface, and you can see it's a nice one. This is from um, one of our websites, Highlight Space Guru, and you can see some nice features on here. You can see the various atomic orbitals of gold, and you can see as well that you have an increase in background as you go up the binary energy scale. Okay, right, so the key factors. The key factors about XPS are that, first of all, it's surface sensitive. We'll have a bit more information about that from some of the other talks. But um, it's surface sensitive because the electrons that are ejected can only travel a certain distance to the solid. And that is of the order of 30 angstroms. That's a very, very rough figure. We know an awful lot more about that different materials, different energies, um, but if you've got in your head 30 angstroms, it's, it's not that big of a number. That's the first point. The second point is that it's um, quantitative. So the number of electrons that we detect is directly proportional to the number of atoms that are present on the surface. And we can use that to quantify the chemistry of the surface hugely important. And then the third point is that it is chemically sensitive. Um, and this is a version of the famous spectrum that Eva, um, that, um, <coughs> the founder of X-ray goes out in spectroscopy. Hi. Um, yeah. Sigma. Sigma, thank you. Um, Hi, Sigma. Um, produced in the gas phase, which illustrates very nicely the quantitative nature of SPS and mechanical sensitivity. 
Um, what you can see, if you want to, if you want to try and get an OI price, it's really important to get some graphics, some good graphics, so that people can see very clearly what you've done, what you've done. Um, and this is a beautiful example. So we have a molecule here, and it's got four different <coughs> carbons. Each of those carbons is in a slightly different environment, and the XPS spectrum shows those four different carbons. You can see um, that they're nicely separated from them, the order that's in the molecule. Now, find the energy increasing from right to left, and um, what's happening is that your binding energy is approximately proportional to the charge on the atom, positive charge on the atom. It's harder to ionize electrons from this one, this atom, than it is from the atom. So we can identify the chemical state from some of Okay. Um, let's just flip back now to the, um, the gold spectrum. Um, so, there's a few features on here that we need to explain that are important. The first one, I've already mentioned it. Notice how the background is increasing as you go from the higher binding energy. What's happening there is that um, this surface sensitivity that we see in XPS is due to electrons um, that are arising from deeper in the sample being scattered, losing energy as they emerge from the sample. And so those, those electrons have lost energy, which means that their kinetic energy is low, which means their binding energy appears to be high, which is why you tend to have an XDS spectrum an increase in the number in the intensity as you go to higher binding energy. And you can see where you've got a, a metal peak, where you've got a peak that comes from above, you get this very characteristic shape where you get this. Uh, this sudden step up in intensity, and that's because you're seeing these electrons being generated deep in the block at that point. Um, that contains an awful lot of information that we are now able to get at, and I think some of my colleagues will be talking about that later. So it, it um, is actually much more important than it appears. And that's one of the things that's important. The other thing that's important here is, um, is illustrated by. Well, if we look at something like the 4S peak, there's a single 4S peak, but the 4P has got two peaks. Why is that? Okay, so uh, let's see if I can explain that. Um, so this is part of the final state effects. We've got quite a bit to talk about on final state effects, and I hope we're only going to get through. Um, so the final state effects, if we take our uh, these are coordinates, and um, as I said before, that's 1s, 2s, 2p. Let's suppose that we take one of our electrons from 2p all. Then what we've got left is one electron. Right now it's one electron. We left one electron in. Um, the spin of the electron can interact with the orbital angular momentum of the orbital that it's in. Now for an S orbital, there's no orbital angular momentum. And so there's no interaction. So for an S orbital, you see a single peak. But for a P orbital, a D orbital, and an F orbital, we have all the angular momentums with quantum numbers one, two, three. And so your electron can interact with that either positively or negatively. And so what you see then is the um, is a difference in energy depending upon the spin of the electron. And that's why we see those two peaks. And it's very characteristic. Uh, let's just move on a bit. So for example, the chlorine. This is chlorine 2p orbital. Chlorine 2p orbital, you've got this um, uh, peak here which has a, um, a J value of 3 over 2, and this peak which has a J value of half. So that's 1 field of momentum plus or minus a half. For D orbitals, it's 2 plus or minus a half, and for F orbitals, 3, and you get this characteristic double peak. 
separation between the peaks depends upon the atomic number and the uh, author that's concerned, but it's, it's characteristic in general. And the ratio between the area of these peaks is also absolutely known. So these are very characteristic peaks you will see in any. Um, okay, so this is a survey scan from <coughs> copper, um, and I put this one in because it shows some other features. So we can see in the survey scan, we can see what elements are present. We've got carbon, oxygen. Here's your copper 3P. The splitting of the copper 3P is very small, so we're not distinguishing it at that point. The splitting of the copper 2P is much bigger, so you can see, well, not you, but you can see, but there's also these peaks here. These are the OJ peaks. And somewhere I have a better picture of an OJ peak. Oh, okay. So the OJ peaks arise from the final state effect. What happens to your ionized atom once your photoelectron is left, except it's not really once the photoelectron is left. Okay, so um, we can continue from here. Just, I know, let me just put some more electrons in there. So, we've created an excited state. We've ionized a core electron. That's not going to be stable. The system is going to relax. And one of the ways that it might relax, there are more than one, but one of the ways it might relax is that the electron can drop down from an up or When that happens, you've got more energy to get rid of. And the way that it can do that is it can eject it can be given to an electron, which, is in, which emerges then from the atom with a kinetic energy. And this is an OJ. This is called an OJ electron. OJ. <clears throat> What's important about OJ peaks is that the energy of the OJ depends upon the difference in energy between where the electron was dropped from to where it ends up. And the electron energy level that the electron is being ionized from. What that means is it's independent of the photon. So OJ peaks are easy to identify because they don't move when you change the photon source. They always have the same kinetic energy. Um, kinetic, uh, OJ peaks are a lot more complicated than straightforward photon electron peaks. Um, but we do understand them quite well now, and we do use them in analysis. I'm not going to discuss that uh, very much. You can see that there are shifts that occur. They're not as easy to calculate because they depend upon the energies of three orbitals, whereas the first electron peaks depend upon the energy of one orbital. Okay. So that's OJ peaks. This is. Um, this is a, an experiment with copper that Shadow Yang will recognize because it's one that he did and he's published in there, which illustrates another feature that you will see in, in some uh, So this is copper again, this is the copper 2P, and I haven't marked it, but this is the this is the spin orbit splitting. So that's the 2P three halves, that's the 2P one half. Um, and you can see uh, what this experiment is about is of a Copper chloride catalyst on carbon. It's used for the synthesis of phosgene, and we were investigating the mechanism of that reaction. And what we're looking at is the way that CO interacts with chlorine that's on the surface, but also um, with the copper. So this is a copper chloride, and the binding energy here of this 2 PP tells us it's copper 2. The other thing that tells us it's copper 2 is this feature. I'll come back to that. What we've done in our XPS spectrometer, so this is the spectrometer that's in Cardiff as part of our XPS, is we've heated the sample up. So we've taken the copper chloride on carbon, we've heated it up to 100, 200, 300, 380 degrees C in vacuum, no effect. Um, and then the top one, at 380 degrees C, we've exposed to, is it an atmosphere of CO or is it more than that? I don't know. Oh, no. It's CO, I can't remember what the pressure is, but it's quite a high pressure. You can get 
reasonably high pressures. This is in a separate cell. It's not in the vacuum chamber itself. It's a separate cell that's within the vacuum chamber. We enclose the sample, uh, expose it to high pressure at high temperature, and we pump the gas out, and then we move the sample back into the vacuum chamber as well. It's not as good as looking in situ on the CO is there, but it's a pretty good approximation. The sample is not exposed to air or any other contaminants between the experiments and the analysis. What you can see is we managed to reduce the sample. Um, so the ship, the thing has shifted to position for carbon uh, for, for copper zero. Um, right, but what I wanted to tell you about was this feature here. So this feature is an example of what's known as shake up. Shake up. Um, is a little bit like ozone, but it's not quite. So, let me see if I can. Um, so, let's have a look. Let's show you that. Uh, once again, we need, we need some um, wiggles. So, I'll just draw three here. These, um, we've got our photon coming in. We're exciting our electron. Electron escapes, but in the process of, ex of escaping, some of the energy it has <coughs> is used to promote an electron between discrete orbitals in your atom or in your molecule. So that's a discrete amount of energy that is given out. And that's what we're seeing with the copper here. These are shaped up satellites where you've got a discrete amount of energy. These are well known. For materials like copper oxide, and they're, they're quite useful uh, analytical tools. So, this feature here is very distinctive of a copper 2 state, whereas a feature slightly further in, I think it's about 938, um, somewhere around here, is characteristic of copper 1. Whereas the binding energy of the uh, copper 2 theme doesn't change very much from copper 0. This feature, this shake up feature of copper one, often appears and is very useful. Um, so that's shake up. Another possibility is where instead of discrete bands, what we've got is a continuum. So now what we've got, same setup, is our, is our um, orbital, the electron is being ejected out of, so this is our photon energy. But now what we've got is a continuum of bands. So you see this very much with uh, conductors. You also see it with things like um, graphite, HOPG, uh, delocalized carbon systems. And what happens here is that the, um, actually the delocalized carbon is a shake up, not a shake off. So this is a shake off we're going to talk about here. <coughs> And what happens here is that because you've got this continuum, you can see electrons being promoted in lots of different levels within that continuum. So instead of seeing a discrete band, what we tend to see is an asymmetry to the peak. And I think I've got an example of that. Yeah, so this is palladium. Let's keep the right there. This is palladium. What you can see from the palladium is that you get, instead of a beautifully symmetric peak, which we get with, say, chlorine, oxygen, um, you get this tray, this tailing edge, and that's due to that shape on Okay. I think I've only got one more thing that I want to say. Just a bit of a thing that I'm out of time. Um, so this is multiplex splitting, and I'm, I'm going to explain what it is, and I'm not going to say much more because it's too complicated. Um, so what we have, it's not that the theory is complicated, but the spectra you see are very complicated, and um, like Mark has done quite a bit of work on this, Dave's done a lot of work on this, and a guy called Mark Basinger over in Canada has done a lot of work looking at characterizing these samples. So what's happening here? So this is called multiplex multiplex splitting. And what's happening here is that you've got um, unpaired electrons in upper orbitals. 
so that when we take our core orbital and we ionize one of these electrons away, the, the electron that remains can still interact with the uh, electrons which are unpaired in the upper left. And that gives rise to all sorts of effects. And so instead of a single Cr2P3 arms peak, which you might expect, you get with copper three here, you've got three electrons in the D orbitals which are in there. And so you can get these very complicated sets of spectra. Okay. Oh, I've got plasma losses. So another example is that you can set up oscillations within the electron C in conductor. This is aluminium, I think. Um, this is aluminium, and you can see these discrete peaks which appear. The number of times we've seen these assigned to specific oxidation states of metals um, in the literature, but they're, they're not really plasma. Oh, okay. So that's a brief introduction to some of the basic theory of XPS. I hope it's useful. Um, my main message is that XPS appears to be very simple, but it's not. There are many, many different factors in the analysis. There's a lot of useful information in the web, in, on the web, but try to go for um, sites which are uh, which have good information. So this is our site, and this tries to collate information from lots of sites around the internet. So go there first and search for information that will get will direct you to places like Mark Basinger's site. Um, feel free to call us up and discuss this analysis. We would much rather spend a bit of time helping you identify where the problems are with your analysis rather than see you try to publish something which is not correct. Um, and then this is our website for applying for analysis and tell me about what we do. I think at that point I'm going to stop and ask for any questions. Okay, so I'm going to now have 